sip of water before a lot of speaking. So, All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to uh, finish off the um, Matthew 24 and just kind of glimpse into 25 just briefly to uh, see how the parable of the ten virgins and uh, the parable of the talents might be connected to what Jesus is saying here and how it really still fits the context. Um, the only part of the Olivet Discourse, and remember the Olivet Discourse, the discussion, we call it discourse, you know, uh, but his discussion, Jesus' discussion with his disciples. Uh, the only um, part of it uh, in Matthew 24 and 25 that clearly has to do with the second coming is the sheep and goat judgment that comes at the very end. And Jesus does begin that section by saying, but when the Son of Man comes in His glory with His angels. Okay, now there's something a little bit different taking place there. You know, gather all the nations before Him. So that's clearly talking about the second coming. But this other, this other event is clearly referring to 70 A.D., so again, let me, um, let me, well, let me read the text we're looking at, and then we're just going to note a couple of things that we've seen to set the context again, and we'll, we'll look at this section to see how it fits that time frame. So Matthew 24, beginning in verse 32, Jesus says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that He is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the fields. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would, have not, would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is this, the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household? to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, well, may the Lord again open our understanding to what we're looking at this evening. So, just again to set the context, so far we've seen that this context of the Olivet Discourse points to 70 AD for its fulfillment for the following reasons. Jesus first pronounce, pronounces eight woes on the Jewish leaders and warns that God's judgment was going to fall on them, on that generation, okay? After he left the temple where he had been speaking to these leaders, after he had pronounced these curses, the disciples asked him when that temple would be torn down, that temple then standing, what the signs of his coming against Jerusalem would be, and that the Jewish age was coming to an end. Jesus was answering those questions in the Olivet Discourse. When explaining the signs, he kept warning them because these things were going to affect them. 
And when he finished answering their questions, he again emphasized that these things would take place in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, that's in our passage this evening. Now, the signs that this judgment was near, as Jesus, you know, talked about, is, as he's answering the questions, he talks about what, what are the things, the signs that these things are near, and that it, is, that it has come, and what's going to happen immediately after that. Well, the signs that this judgment was near, as we saw, were fulfilled in that time frame. We have um, historic records of these things taking place. Many of the disciples lived to see that this judgment had come. They saw the abomination of desolation, remember, which began with Jerusalem being surrounded by the Roman armies and ends with the desolation of the temple, actually the temple being torn down. Those who were ready fled the country, as Jesus said they should, and they survived, and those who weren't were trapped in the city and had to endure the greatest sufferings that anyone would ever have to face. Now, last week, we looked at what Jesus said would happen immediately after. Remember, there would be signs in the heavens, the sun, moon uh, would be darkened, the stars would fall from the sky. And as we saw Old Testament examples of this same kind of language, it refers to judgment upon a nation when God darkens the stars of the heavens over them. The sign of the Son of Man would appear in the sky. When Jesus came in judgment, it would be clear to the Jewish leaders at that time that it was Jesus who had come as he warned that he would and that he really was their Messiah. And of course, he was judging them for their rejection of him. All the tribes of the earth or the land would mourn, you know, since they wouldn't receive Jesus with joy as their Savior, all the tribes of Israel would lament His coming in judgment. And Jesus would send out His angels with a great trumpet to gather His elect. You know, now that, that, um, um, that everyone really within the whole world, at least that, that term, the whole world, which referred to the Roman Empire, had been reached. Uh, before judgment came. Now it was time for the gospel to go to the furthest places under heaven. Remember what Lightfoot, uh, John Lightfoot wrote about this. He said, when Jerusalem shall be reduced to ashes and that wicked nation cut off and rejected, then shall the Son of Man send his ministers with the trumpet of the gospel and they shall gather his elect of the several nations from the four corners of heaven so that God shall not want a church, that is, he shall not lack a church. Okay. Now, that is actually still ongoing today. We still haven't reached the far ends of the earth, and that, that's important because uh, that, that does say something about when we can expect Jesus to return, because that does need to be carried out. Now, tonight, again, let's finish by looking at Jesus' final warnings to his disciples to be ready. Now, he first warns them through the parable of the fig tree. And let me again read those two verses, 32 and 33. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Now, let me just say that what Jesus says here is, is meant to be taken straightforward. Okay, there's no hidden meaning here. What Jesus is saying is, you know when summer is coming by the signs. And one of those signs is you see the fig tree putting out its leaves. Okay? Well, so too, Jesus says, when you see all these things, the signs I've been referring to, the things he's detailed in the discussion, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Now, again, note Jesus says, when you see all these things. He was talking to his disciples. They would live to see this event. Not all of them, but many of them. Now, again, we know this because of what he says next, and, and this is that bracketing time frame in verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, again, how do we know that, that Jesus, when he was talking about this generation, was referring to the people who were then living, that the time frame would not extend really beyond 40 years? 
Well, it's because every time the word generation is used, I remember, I remember R.C. Sproul saying in the New Testament that it refers to the people then living. Now, I didn't go through the entire New Testament, but I did go through Matthew's Gospel, and I found every example in which it's used. And in every example, it refers to the people then living. And since there aren't that many of them, I thought we could perhaps read them together. So first of all, in Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19, Jesus says this, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Clearly, Jesus here was speaking about those who were alive at that time who were criticizing him. You see, they were a generation that couldn't be pleased. You know, John wasn't eating and drinking, and they criticized him. Jesus came eating and drinking. They criticized him. They just couldn't be pleased. They were going to reject whatever the Lord sent. So he's, he's referring to the people who were alive during the time of his ministry. The next example is in Matthew 12, verses 39 through 45. He said to those Jews who asked for a sign, and by the way, we have several examples of the word generation here. An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monsters, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they, repre they, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Notice again, Jesus is indicting them for their wickedness because there is something greater uh, than Solomon who is present. There is someone uh, who is, um, again, greater than... Um, well, then Solomon what was the first one, that uh, the men of Nineveh, someone greater than Jonah. Okay, so there are those who hear him and who are rejecting him, and judgment is going to be severe for them uh, in the end. So again, he's indicting them, the people then living, because of the way they responded to his ministry. He says something similar in Matthew 16, verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. Again, speaking to the people then living. Another example in Matthew 17, verse 17, when the man brought his son to Jesus to heal him, Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And then the last two uses are the uses we've already looked at. Matthew 23, 36. Remember Jesus, after pronouncing the eight curses, the eight woes upon the Pharisees, and the fact that all the, the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth is going to fall on them. He says, truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And remember, the reason for that was because they were rejecting Christ. And they were rejecting his servants, okay? And then the very last one that, I, that we're looking at right now, our text. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things 
take place. Okay, every use of the word generation is used in an indictment against the Jews living at that time because they rejected him. He was speaking to the Jews then living. And the point is, he wasn't speaking to some generation, some 2,000 years plus in the future, as many in the church uh, actually believe. Now, that's what Jesus is, is saying. I mean, that's the group he's speaking to um, and that he's referring to that isn't going to die until all these things take place. Now, if you've been in broad evangelical churches, maybe you've heard something like this, you know, with regard to an interpretation of the parable of the fig tree. I certainly did. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel, the putting forth of its leaves, their rebirth as a nation, which occurred in 1948. That generation that would see the rebirth of Israel as a nation in 1948 would not pass away until Christ comes to rapture his church and then at the end of seven years return in his second coming. And that's why so many were expecting Jesus to return in 1981. Now, I'm not sure where you were in 1981. <laughs> I mean, some of us were here. Others, I, I'm not sure exactly uh, uh, everyone's particular uh, birth date. But in 1981, I was in a church that, that believed this. And um, it, it certainly does affect you, okay? So this is the way it goes. If, if Israel became a nation in 1948, and a biblical generation is roughly 40 years, then Jesus' second coming was going to be in 1988, okay? But you have a seven-year tribulation that takes place before that, and you have this sort of partial coming of Jesus to rapture his church before that takes place. So he had to return in 1981 to take his church out of the world before the tribulation would begin. And if you were, you know, in one of those churches uh, in 1981, you might remember there was a great deal of excitement. There was a great deal of concern. Okay, excitement, Jesus was coming. Concern for your lost family members and neighbors and friends that would be left to endure the seven-year tribulation period. Now, that really provoked a lot of people to do evangelism, okay? Now, that was a good thing, but it also created a problem, and that is when it didn't happen the way everybody said it was going to happen, then those who heard this interpretation began to think the Bible is wrong, so it must not be God's Word. Now, that is why we really have to be careful how we interpret Scripture. We don't want to uh, spread, you know, false interpretations. Um, another very famous Bible teacher, Harold Camping, remember, wrote a book, 1994, in which he said Jesus was returning in 1994, and there were a lot of people who were excited about it and believed his, his understanding of Scripture. Did Jesus come in 1994? No, he didn't. So did that damage the church? Very possibly uh, did. So again, we just need to be careful. All Jesus was saying by the parable of the fig tree is that his disciples would know that judgment is near when they saw the signs that he had given to them. Now, secondly, he warned them to listen, to pay careful attention to what he was saying, because what he is saying is the word of God. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is the same language Jesus uses in, in Matthew 5, 18, to emphasize the fact that until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle, I think I'm quoting the King James there, but uh, not one stroke or, you know, of, or letter of the law shall, shall pass away, okay, until everything is accomplished. Now, what he is saying is that's God's Word, and it's, it's going to remain steadfast until it's accomplished the purpose for which God has sent it. In the Jewish mind, as long as heaven and earth endure meant forever, okay? Peter tells us that this is true and can only be true of God's Word. 1 Peter 1, verses 24 and 25, he says, for all flesh is like grass, and it's glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but 
the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, Jesus is saying, this is the word I'm telling you, disciples. This is God's word. This is going to happen, and you can count on it. And again, he's telling them because it would affect them. Third, they would know the, the season, but not the precise time. Okay? They, they would know summer is near, so to speak. The judgment is near, but not the exact time. You know, even Jesus says he did not know this in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, you know Jehovah's Witnesses love to use this verse to try to prove that Jesus is not God. Because God, by definition, knows all things, right? And if Jesus is God, then Jesus must know all things. But here's something Jesus didn't know. And so they conclude he must not be God. Now, you know our answer to this is, is this, that Jesus is also fully man as well as fully God. And man, by definition, is limited. Jesus has infinite and unlimited knowledge in his divine nature, but not in his human nature. Now, the fact that he didn't know the exact time of his coming does not prove that he isn't God. What it does is it proves that he is true man. We know there were times when Jesus had divine knowledge communicated to him by the Holy Spirit, but notice in this case, it wasn't, okay? Because it wasn't God's will that he know. And I think the reason was so that the disciples wouldn't know. And fourthly, the reason why he didn't want them to know was so that they would be ready at all times. Now, now this, this is key. You know, when, you, when something unexpectedly, you know, is, if there's something in the future that's unexpected, you, you have to be ready at all times for it, and there's an advantage to that. Now, Jesus tells us, first of all, that there would be those that wouldn't be ready, those who would be caught off guard, okay? Verses 37 through 39. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Jesus, as you know, always warns his people before he brings judgment so that they will be ready. He told Noah to build the ark so that he and his household would be saved from the coming judgment. Noah listened. Noah built the ark, and he was saved from that flood. But the Lord also warns those who are not his, okay? Peter tells us in, in a rather enigmatic way that Christ, by his Holy Spirit, preached righteousness through Noah and perhaps the way he did it was, you know, we might get the impression maybe Noah went around preaching. Uh, perhaps he did. But certainly building the ark was one, one way in which he was declaring God's judgment is coming. I mean, why was he building this huge boat when there was no body of water anywhere around? But they didn't listen. They didn't understand. They didn't believe. They weren't watching. For them, it was business as usual. Life was just simply going on. And the flood caught them by surprise and swept them all away. Jesus says the same would be true when he came in judgment. There would be those who were not ready. Verses 40 and 41, then Jesus said, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill one will be taken and one will be left. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, again, many believe he's referring to the rapture, you know. Um, when the rapture comes, there, there's going to be some who will be ready and they'll go with Jesus. And there will be those who aren't ready who are going to be left behind to face the tribulation. Now, I don't have time to prove this, but the problem with that understanding 
is first of all, it doesn't fit the context because the context is 70 AD. But secondly, Jesus in his second coming is only coming once, not twice, okay? Not partially and then fully, but he's coming fully, okay? And when he does, when he does come, he's coming to empty the graves. He's coming to gather all the living to the final judgment. In other words, when he comes, there's not going to be two men in the field and one left. There's going to be two men in the field and none left. And there's going to be two women grinding at the mill and then none grinding at the mill because everybody is taken and everybody is gathered to that one great event, the final judgment. So that's not what he's talking about here. It doesn't fit the context, 70 AD, and it doesn't make sense in light of what the Bible tells us about Christ's second coming. But what he is talking about here are those who are taken by the Romans and those who are not. After the Romans broke into the city of Jerusalem, there were many who were taken, either enslaved or killed. But there are also those who were left behind, who were spared. And I think what Jesus is simply saying here is that in the middle of this judgment, yes, there would be many who would die in this judgment, but God in his mercy would spare some. Okay. So there was, again, the possibility of escaping all these things, so the disciples needed to be ready. So Jesus says in verse 42, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Now, Jesus fifthly illustrates this by giving, again, the illustration of the thief in the night, okay, which is the title of a series of movies about Christ's second coming or, you know, the rapture and the tribulation and so forth. But again, it is true that this is referring to his unexpected coming, but not before a tribulation, but rather uh, in judgment in 70 AD. He says in verses 43 through 44, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Okay, so I hope you see the, the contrast here. If you know when the thief is coming, you'll be ready for him at that time. Okay, because you know when he's coming, you'll be ready. But if you don't know when he's coming, then when do you have to be ready? You have to be ready all the time. Well, you see, that's the way Jesus was coming. He was coming at an unexpected time. So the disciples needed to be watchful all the time. That's really all that means. And then finally, the only way they could be ready was by being faithful to what Jesus called them to do. And that's really what this last part is all about, verses 45 through 51. He says, who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I told you uh, we're not going to look at chapter 25, but just taking a peek ahead, what is the point of the parable of the ten virgins? Be ready, okay? What is the parable? What's the parable of the talents all about? Be faithful, okay? Be faithfully doing what your Lord has told you to do because he's coming at an unexpected time. So he's making the same point here that he's making there, and that is if you are faithfully doing what the Lord calls you to do, it really doesn't matter when he comes, okay? Because you'll be ready, but if you're not faithful, okay, you won't be ready. Now, let me just close with this simple point, okay? 70 AD is, is behind us, so we don't need to be ready for what Jesus is speaking about right 
in, in our text because this has already happened. His second coming, okay, are we going to live to see that? Well, again, if we understand the passages in the New Testament talking about the eminency of Christ's coming, we're, we, you know, um, those are not referring to the second coming because when Jesus said that, the whole world still needed to be evangelized, okay? The Roman Empire before 70 AD and then the four corners of the earth, that's still being done today. Jesus could not have meant his second coming was imminent. But the coming that was imminent was 70 AD. That is what they needed to be ready for. So his second coming is still a long ways off because there, there are still many places that haven't been reached with the gospel and I would say very likely will not be reached in our lifetime, whether we're you know, pushing the end of our lives or whether we still have you know, more of it ahead of us. However, Jesus coming for us at death, okay, is something that we need to be prepared for because we don't know when that's going to take place, do we? That's unexpected, isn't it? So how can you be ready for something that you don't know is when it's going to happen? Well, by being ready for it all the time. And, and that's, again, the reason why we don't know the day or the hour of our death is so that we will be ready at all times. And how can we be ready? Well, by being faithful, okay? By being faithful. First of all, we need to trust Christ, trust Him alone for our justification, our acceptance with God. We can't do it. We can't be good enough. Jesus has done it all. We need to trust Him. But having trusted Him, as we saw this morning, we need to keep His Word. He says, if you love me, you will keep my word. And he also says, he who does, who does not love me does not keep my words. So we can be ready only by trusting Christ, and we know that we truly are trusting Christ by keeping his word, okay? by being faithful in serving him, being faithful in worshiping him, being faithful in everything the Lord calls us to do in our particular callings, okay? If we're doing that, then when the Lord returns for us, we will be ready to meet Him. And that is really the most important thing, I think, in life, isn't it? Is to be ready for His coming for us. So let's be faithfully doing. We don't know when He's coming, but uh, we know we can be ready uh, by trusting Him. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and um, let's ask the Lord to give us grace to do that.